hello and good evening. Welcome to Bible Study Live. Thank you for tuning in, logging in, for liking, commenting, and sharing, subscribing, being a part of what we do every Wednesday evening. Thank you for those who come in the building as well as those online. We do appreciate you as we are in this Holy Week leading up to Resurrection Sunday. We thank God for what uh, the Father did when he sent the Son and when the Son died for us. And so it's always an important week. So let's move into our uh, Bible study by bowing our heads and praying. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We appreciate you. We honor you. God, we ask that you would illuminate the study. Bless the ears of the listeners, God, the hearts of the listeners, the spirit of the listeners, as well as touch the mouth of the speaker, the heart of the speaker, and the spirit of the speaker, so that we will have a moment of clarity and understanding and wisdom and revelation. Knowledge can flow freely, unhindered, uninterrupted, and unchecked by any satanic or demonic forces. God, we pray a special prayer over those people in Baltimore who were affected by the, the bridge, God, and other things that we may not know about. We ask that you would just bless and encourage those families, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. So we are in our Esther series and have been enjoying it. I won't do the recap. I'll just start where we were on Sunday. And we were in a sermon titled, I Saw the King. And so it was also Palm Sunday. So we have the palm branches in the background. But we didn't really make any reference in that until later on. So what we were doing is just going through the observations from Esther chapters three and four. So previously we had covered chapters one and two in each one of those chapters were a, a different sermon. On this one, we covered chapters three and four. These all, this whole series has been a little longer as far as on a Sunday morning, me preaching it because it's a lot of scriptures, but trying to take a lot of time. Esther is really a fascinating uh, book, and I'm not for sure how much further I'm going to go into it, but one of the most fascinating things about it, it is the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention the word God in it. And so it, it's interesting to see the hand of God all throughout the book without the mention of God. And so that, let, that goes to show us when we are in certain uh, places, areas of our life, maybe on our jobs or in places where God is not openly acknowledged. It doesn't mean God is not at work, especially if you're there. God knows how to work behind the scenes, through the scenes, work through people, promote people, demote people. He knows how to move things around strategically. There's an old saying, you know, that Satan is playing checkers, but God is playing chess. He's so strategic. And so this book shows just some of the strategy of God without being overtly God this, God that, which is something you don't see. And it's because of the fact that they were exiled. And uh, on today, I uh, got some more information that by this time, it was a hundred years after the fall of Babylon. And so some of the people of Israel had come back, like the Ezra, the Nehemiah. Some of them had made it back to the actual land of Israel, but some people had not made it back. And Mordecai was one of those uh, people. And so he was now living in this new land, but he still was holding on to what he knew about God. So let's pick this up with uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. And it says this, Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. So basically, that got him into second in command. Now, in chapter 2, there was a piece of chapter 2 that we did not cover. We stopped with Esther. Esther got the crown on her head. We didn't go into uh, the extra piece. But there was a reference to a guy named Haman. We come here, and he becomes a much more prominent figure in the story. But there's something I didn't talk about Sunday morning that I really want to point out 
today, and that is it calls him the son of this person that's kind of hard to pronounce, Hamadatha, but it says the Agagite. That Agagite is very, very important, very actually important to the story because of a blunder that happened several, several years ago, probably over uh, a thousand years prior We'll, we see in the book of uh, Samuel, right around the 15th chapter, we see a story where God had told Saul to kill everyone, to this enemy that they had, to kill them all. And he eventually did what was supposed to be done, except for he kept back a few things. And he kept back a king named Agag. And Samuel shows up. And this is the time where we see that Saul actually lost the kingdom because of his rebelliousness. So chapter 15 shows Saul's rebellion. And then 16, we see an anointing of a sp per special person named David. 17 is David and Goliath. So chapter 15 of 1 Samuel is very important because it shows how Saul, through his disobedience, lost position. But his disobedience shows up much later because, once again, it says that this Haman was of the Agagite family. And so Agagite is from Agag. And so God had told Saul to kill all of them. Don't keep none of them back. And he's like, well, I kept a few things, and I kept this king Agag as like a trophy. And Samuel's like, that's not what God said. Well, later on, we see from this line of Agag, who should have been destroyed a long time ago, we see this person named Haman. And so there is a ax to grind from Haman and his family because of what happened back in Saul's day. But if Saul had completely follow God, then we wouldn't even be dealing with this. And so I bring that up to say this, is that when God tells us to do something, no matter how illogical it sounds, when we disobey it, its consequences and ramifications for decades, centuries, even millennial, millenniums, because we don't follow the will of God. And so now we're dealing with this man, Haman, who's coming on the scene. He's now risen to power to be the second in command, but we begin to see that he has an ax to grind against a specific group of people. All right, and so verse two says, I mean, this will actually skip to two, but the second section of scriptures we have is verses five through six. It says, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. So he became very angry and upset. And one of the reasons why is because Mordecai is coming from the Jewish lineage, the Jewish heritage, and what they were taught and told, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not worship any other god. And so even though Mordecai is in this land, this new land, he's not going to violate the commandments of his youth. He's not going to violate what he's learned, what he's understood. And so he doesn't mind respecting people, but this bowing down to, this worshiping, he knows you don't worship man, you worship God and God alone. And so there was a refusal of him to go along with the program because it violated everything that he understood. And all throughout the Torah and the things that he's read and learned, he knows that God is the only one that you are supposed to worship. Nothing wrong with giving respect to men, giving some deferential treatment. Even, even in our celebrity culture, nothing wrong with celebrating people. But if you don't know what to worship and who to worship, you will invariably worship the wrong thing. And so that's why God had told his people, if you put me at the top, I'm at the apex of all of creation. Nobody gets worshiped the way I get worshiped. And so Mordecai understood, I cannot under any circumstances 
worship Haman the way he wants to be worshipped because you do not worship man. You do not worship things. You can respect man. You can respect things. You can celebrate man. You can celebrate things, but worship goes to God alone. So he had to make a choice. We see this uh, also uh, before previous in the times of uh, Nebuchadnezzar times. We see this with Daniel. When Daniel, there was a decree that he couldn't pray and Daniel would not stop praying. We see it with the three Hebrew boys when they were told they had to worship this statue or be thrown in the fire. They was like, we will choose to be thrown in the fire because the way they were raised and where they were understand that high place of worship is held for God and held for God alone. So for Mordecai, this was a violation and he just chose not to do it. But it filled Haman with rage because he had the, he had the wrong spirit. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. In our first uh, sermon in this series, we realized that his empire was 127 provinces. He was trying to grow it that stretched from India all the way to Ethiopia. And so Haman, once he begins to realize, okay, who is this Mordecai? And he begins to find out his nationality, his heritage. I'm not sure how much Haman knew about King Agag and who would have been killed. I don't know how much he knew. All I know is the moment he realized the heritage of Mordecai, he was not okay with just dealing harshly with Mordecai. He wanted to take out the entire lineage, all the Jews. And so, of course, this is demonically motivated. One of the things that probably God saw in the future and was trying to get Saul to handle it way, way back then, but because of his disobedience, now a new group of people are facing a new set of hatred. And so uh, one of the things I pointed out Sunday that racism, ethnic-based hatred is not a new thing. It's not only a thing that black people in America have dealt with. It's throughout human history. There is a demonic spirit that humans get hold on to where they will hate people based only because of their ethnicity, their background, the color of their skin. And so it is demonic, very demonic. And so that led us to our first point that we wanted to discuss. And that was this, when you mix ego with evil, that's a recipe of disaster. The simple fact that Haman wanted to be worshiped as a man shows that he was egotistical probably narcissistic, but when you mix that with evil, it becomes a recipe of for disaster. And all throughout history, we have seen this recipe with dictators. You see it with uh, the Mussolini's, the Napoleons, the Hitler's, those people who are very egotistical and narcissistic, but when they are in places of power, especially when they have hatred and they're trying to elevate one race over the other, then there's a mindset of wipe out people. We know this in uh, scientific terms, or even biological terms. We know this as genocide. It is the killing of one entire group of people. We've seen it all throughout human history, and we see it again here in the Bible. And so Haman has this evil spirit, but not only does he have an evil spirit, he has an egotistical spirit. But the, but, but the problem, this is what I didn't add, the problem with this ego and evil is when those people are in positions of power. When people are not in positions of power and their ego and their evil are mixed, sometimes they're, they are limited at how far they can go. But when you take those people and you put them in power, And the problem with leadership often is it takes a fair amount of ego to sometimes be a great leader. So ego in itself is not bad, but when you mix ego with an evil spirit, especially a spirit that is elitist and only my family, only my color, only my political party, when you mix that 
then and you put those people in leadership, it is a recipe for disaster. And we've seen it all throughout human history. All right, let's move further on into the passages of eight and nine of Esther three. It says, then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, there's a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. And so we see it even through the New Living Translation to show us it was definitely racism. It was definitely ethnic base. It went beyond just his own personal offense with the way Mordecai was acting. It went beyond that into full-blown uh, racism. Another uh, thing it's called, it's, it's called genocide, but it's also called ethnic cleansing, where they believe that a certain ethnic or racial group of people are a contamination. So wipe them out, kill them all, get rid of them all. So it's, so it's very evil. Verse 9 says this, their laws are different from those of any other people. And they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. Now, we've seen this earlier in the first sermon. We see one thing that you see with the evil spirit is there is a certain level of exaggeration. They begin to exaggerate and make it worse than what it is. Actually make up things lie. And so you, you see that with that egotistical and evil spirit. In order to get accomplish what they need to accomplish, they have to lie. And sometimes that, if that means they have to generalize, generalize, stereotype a whole group of people, they don't mind doing it. In our day and age, we have a crisis and we have, it, have had it for a decade. We have crisis at the border where you have immigrants and migrants trying to come over. And in the coming over, there have been some evil people. There have been some criminal people, but that happens in every race of people. There's a certain criminal element in every race of people. You have a whole group of blacks. There are some blacks that are criminals. You have a whole group of whites. There's some whites that are criminals. You could have a whole group of gays. Some of those gays are criminals, a whole group of Asians, on and on and on. But what the evil spirit does is it flips it and it takes a percentage of people, which every race has a percentage of criminals. It takes that and flips it and makes it the entire race. So you can't trust blacks. They're all criminals. That's not true. That is a total exaggeration. There's a percentage of us that are criminals, but it's a percentage of every race. So when it comes to the immigrants, we can't let them into the borders because they're rapists. They're druggists. No, some of them are rapists. Some of them are in the drug cult cartels. But in most cases, it is not even a majority. It's just some. So we see the same thing here with Haman. Haman says they don't obey the king's laws. Well, well, there is no proof of that. He's exaggerating because when you hate someone, you have to make them look worse than what they really are. You have to exaggerate. You have to lie on. In America, Blacks have been lied on through the media, through a lot of things. Many times, and that's why black history is important, because many times they will not show our advancements. They will not show our contributions. They only want to show us in the criminal light. They only want to show us when we've done wrong. You will not hear about the blacks that have graduated with degrees. You only see on the news media those who are shooting in the streets. It is unfair, but it is a racist, demonic spirit. Not new, not singled out to just black people. It's happened all throughout human history. There's been times when whites were not uh, in prominence, where it was they were on the bottom of the barrel. It, in uh, some biblical times, those who were known as the barbarians were actually those who were of more white uh, descent. Uh, more European descent. So they face di discrimination. It's all throughout human history. And it is, at the end of the day, it is a satanic, demonic spirit that he's been using for ages. And so we have to recognize it. And when we see it, we need to call it out. But when you dig through scriptures, you, you just see it. It's everywhere. 
Then he adds this, if it pleases the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administration to be deposited in the royal treasury. This is so beautiful to me because it's something that we need to see and understand. And this goes on now, especially in our American context. It happens all throughout the political arena. If I want something done, whether it's right or wrong, all I have to do is give enough money to the government, throw enough money, and I can get laws that would hurt people that I know would hurt people. But when you have bad people in power, they see dollar signs. I don't care how this is going to affect the community. I don't care how this is going to affect this person, that person. And sometimes it affects people for generations, affects families for generations. But because a lobbyist comes up and throws money at this person, that person, hey, I'll take care of your family. I'll take care of your family, family. If you will push this book, this law on the books, if you get this, a lot of the laws that we have, they don't have any real foundation in them except for someone paid enough money to get it out there not new at all, see it all the way back here in the time of Esther. And so Haman has an ax to grind. And another problem we have, we have a weak leader, Xerxes. We've seen throughout his weakness. We've seen from the, from the very beginning that he's, he's weak. And one of the reasons he's weak because he's given to wine. So he doesn't make a lot of good judgments. And so Haman knows he can be manipulated with a little bit of uh, coaxing here, let's throw some money at this and then get him to make a decree. Another thing we see is that he he was quick to make decrees that were lasting. We see that that's how Vashti got, was gotten rid of. He listened to his boys. They were like, hey, put this in the law. So people knew this about Xerxes. If you get him in the right position, and uh, especially if you get, get him drinking, he can make laws. And so Haman with his evil self, knew what he, exactly what he was doing. And so that leads us to this point. Difference intimidates weak-minded people. So when you look at the reason he was willing to give money to get a law on the books it was simply because these people were different. Started off with him being offended the way Mordecai wouldn't worship him, but then he began to say, hey, these people, their laws are different. And so a lot of times difference intimidates people and intimidates weak-minded people. Strong-minded people, especially leaders, they celebrate difference because maybe there's something different about you that I can learn from, I can grow from. Maybe I'll never be like you, but I can celebrate your difference. And we're seeing that even now in the George Floyd era, there was a, a new uh, group or a thing that they begin to institute in many major corporations called DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, beginning to understand that there's no way this man should have been able to have his foot and knee on this guy's neck and just snuff his life out. We're going to have to look at including people, understanding. And so it started off well, but of course this evil racist spirit that's in the land, it does not want to go easy. And so there are a lot of people now trying to erase DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're saying, no, certain people need to be on top. Certain people need to be on the bottom. It's really a caste system that the way any caste system work is you have to have your haves and your have nots. You have to have your winners and your losers. Everybody can't be on the same playing field, all working together. No, there has to be highs and lows. And so that is weak-minded leadership, and we've dealt with it for years. Here's another point that I want to piggyback on. Only pure hatred makes you want to destroy someone over difference. Difference is just that. It is different. Sometimes you have to learn difference. But when you want to destroy someone just because they're different, whether it's racism which is, deals with ethnic, or it's sexism, which deals with genders, or it's ageism. I don't like you just because you're older. I don't like you just because you're younger. There's so many different isms and schisms. And so that's why throughout scripture, 
God begins to talk about love and how you treat your fellow human man because our human weakness is to not celebrate difference, but to actually hate difference. I hate you because you're different. I hate you because you have more money than me. I hate you because you drive a better car than me. I hate you because I think you look better than me. I hate you because you look worse than me. I hate you because you're disabled. Ugh, I don't like the way your arm is cut off. So, all kinds of things. And the difference just happens. Different is not a bad thing. But there's an evil spirit in the human nature that makes you want to hate people because of difference. And it's not just that. It's, it's one thing for someone to hate someone because of difference. It's the extra piece that goes beyond that. I want to destroy them. I want to get rid of them because they're different. I don't want anybody in my company who's different than me, who votes different than me. If you vote different than me, I want to marginalize you. Eventually, I'm going to find a way to fire you, to get rid of you because you're different. You do things different. I don't like them because they're louder than me. I want all quiet people around me. It's so much of that that has happened. And like I said, said a hundred times that I'll say it again, it is a human weakness and it's a demonic spirit. The devil knows I can get people to fight over difference. Now, when you take it out of this context and you put it in the kingdom of God context, the problem is we've had the same problem. The apostolics don't like the Kojics. Kojics don't like the Baptists. Baptists don't like the Methodists. And then you have a lot of Christian people who feel like only their sect is going to make it to heaven, only their group. Then you get beyond the denominations and it's down to just my church. It's not even the denomination. Only my church is going to make it to heaven. Well, if your church has 75 people, that's going to be a boring heaven where only 75 people are going to be there. You're telling me that Jesus died for the whole world and only a few folk are going to make it in, all these few special people, and anybody that's different, that worship different, sings different, functions different. A lot of problem with our Christianity, our Western Christianity, is we never traveled overseas. And so we haven't seen how other people worship and how they move and how some of them dance with their body, especially in, in the African celebration. We would call it, no, that's not right. It's not that it's not right. It's just different. Learn how to celebrate difference and not hate difference. And even if difference bothers you, don't try to destroy it and kill it all because that shows you're functioning out of demonic forces. Esther 10 and 11 says this, the king agreed confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, son of the Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Now, this lets us know really what he was. He was just an enemy of the Jews. The king said, the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. So I'm going to give you this money, donate this money to the treasury and and the king said, hey, take the money, take whatever you need to do what you want to get rid of whoever you want to get rid of. I don't care. It don't affect me, so I don't care. Real leaders it, it care about what affects the people around them. We'll see that later. All right, let's go here. Weak leaders empower bad ideas. No, no, no time in Xerxes' mind did it dawn on him. You know what? This is probably a bad idea. One of the reasons why it's a bad idea is because these people are in my kingdom. They actually help my kingdom. I don't know what jobs they do in the kingdom. Maybe some of the jobs that we need done, are they are important in. So if we kill them all, I'm actually going to be hurting my own self. But weak leaders empower bad ideas. And I always say this, it's hard to know how good a leader is until you really have had a bad leader. A bad boss will make you appreciate a good boss. A bad spouse will make you appreciate a good spouse. And the problem with a lot of young people, they only get one set of parents. And so they don't know how good their parents are. Oh, I can't stand mom, I can't stand daddy. But they ain't never had a set of bad parents. They haven't had an abusive father, abusive mother. And so people who have had that, they recognize and respect a good parent. So. Many times you really don't know how good a leader is until you've experienced weak leadership. 
Esther 13 through 15 from uh, verses 3 says, Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews. It shows you how demonic the plan was. Young and old, women and children, spare no one, hateful, evil. In one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. So this is something interesting that in the law, Haman wanted it. Well, I want to get rid of them in one day. I'm, I'm, I, I want to do a genocide, wipe them all out in one day. Don't care anything about them. So there was enough of them that he felt like they could all be killed in one day. But but just group them up and just wipe them out. Really, really evil. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. And here's another horrible thing, and we see it with horrible leadership. They wanted to get the people to do their dirty work. So they were sending out the decree to go in all the 127 provinces and however far it had grown from chapter one till now to get them to kill those people. In other words, if your neighbor is a Jew, Hey, by law, we're telling you, you can kill them. We're empowering you to kill them. There's going to be no uh, ramifications for you doing it, no punishment. We want it done, and you guys can do it, and we're making it law. But what if I don't want to kill them? Now it's law. Now you'll get in trouble for disobeying the law. So when you get people who are really bad and poor leaders and they're demonically influenced, filled with ego and evil, they write things in the law, but they get other people to do their dirty work. In America, I've seen it as studying what they what they really did is they got poor white people to do their dirty work. They disenfranchised a lot of the poor whites, but they taught them at least you're better than these black people. At least you're better than these slaves. So you have to watch them. They'll steal your women. They'll rape your women. They'll take them and they taught them that but really what they were doing it was just lying about what they did because it was the wealthy white masters that stole our women that raped our women that did all of that but they flipped it and they told the poor whites that these people are against you you know blah 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 you 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 understand if you lived in America and you've studied all you understand what has happened but it's the spirit of getting someone else to do your dirty work for you and creating chaos and confusion and trouble, which we'll see in just a, a second, and then you living the high life. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel, which is the capital of the whole uh, kingdom. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Another uh, show of the idiocy, uh, the weakness, the evil, the demonic capacity of these leaders. While everyone is thrown in confusion, they're having drinks. They're partying. And there's a lot of things that, like that when you have evil leaders in power they will make decrees and laws and rules and things that causes confusion for everybody. And they'll sit back and go on vacation, enjoy. There are times where uh, CEOs have laid off and fired whole groups of people, ruined families' lives. Uh, and even in my job, I've seen where right around Christmas time, they got rid of all the temps who were promised a job. They were promised to be hired in January. And in November, right after Thanksgiving, they fired all of them. Now, guess what? Some of those leaders went and had Thanksgiving vacations and Christmas vacations while they had threw other people's families into chaos. We had one particular temporary who had been a temporary for nine years. They used him. So what, basically he was doing the same work as everybody else, but getting paid a lower rate and was promised a job in the contract. They were allowed to vote on the contract. Of course, they voted yes because they knew they were going to get a job in January. And in the Thanksgiving break, they got fired and never got back. 
in January to hire new temps. Somebody made that decision, knew what they were doing, and didn't care. Went and had them some drinks, some margaritas at the bar and laughed. And it's evil. And it happens all the time. But here, know this. Point five. Poor leaders don't care that their decisions create chaos and confusion. A good leader, it hurts them when people under them are hurt. Poor leaders could care less. Moving on to chapter four. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and went out into the city, crying with a loud and bitter wail. Now we see the difference. Haman and Xerxes, they're drinking, don't care. Mordecai, this is going to affect all the people he loves and he knows, but some of the people that he don't know. But it affected him because he was a good leader. He was a good person. And there are certain people in life that certain laws are not going to affect me because I've gone beyond uh, certain things. In other words, I have maybe through my credit score, I'm able to live in a certain area, drive a certain thing. But certain laws affect people that don't have the privileges I have, and it hurts me. Even though it's not going to affect me, it still hurts me because a good leader, a real leader, cares about the plight of the people around them. One of the worst things that can happen is for you to be blessed and blessed alone. Who do you share it with? Who do you celebrate with? If only you and your few arrive at the top and there's nobody to share with and you don't pull anybody up, really that's lonely and it's poor leadership. A good leadership leader always wants to reach back and pull somebody up. So Mordecai, when he hears the news, he is totally affected by it. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. So he went as close as he could to what we would call city hall or to where all the deals and decisions were making, being made. He didn't want to just hide in the back and cry in the back. He wanted to be seen. He wanted to be heard. In other words, let me show up at city council. And let me say, this ain't right. Even though it may not affect you, it's affecting other people. I want to say something. I want to vote right. I want to put something on social media. I was in a situation where I was okay when Black Lives Matter was going on. I wasn't really affected. But you want to know what I did? I got me a Black Lives Matter sign. Nobody close to me had got beaten by police and hurt by police. But just because it wasn't close to me doesn't mean it wasn't close to me because it could have been me. Trayvon Martin could have been my son. These other things, it could have been mine. So my heart goes out. I am 100% straight male. Don't really even understand how a man could like another man. But when I see someone discriminated because they're gay, beat because they're gay. It, my heart breaks. No, I don't feel like that is right. That is wrong. Even though I'm not that, it affects me when other people are hurt. When I was looking at what happened in Baltimore with the ship that hit the bridge, I was watching some of the footage and I'm thanking God for every car that made it across in the nick of time. Because even though it wasn't my family, not, I don't know anybody in those cars, I understand devastation and pain. And then to find out that there were at least uh, eight people that were working on the bridge and now six of them they cannot find. So that's why at the beginning of Bible study, I pray about it. I've never even been to Baltimore, but my heart breaks because I'm human. When you are a poor human, you don't care what happens to other people. You can drink and party and it'll be okay. But real especially genuine people, especially people of God, their heart breaks when other people are hurting. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. One thing I liked about it is they immediately turned to God. 
Sometimes in the worst crisis, the first thing you need to do is turn to God. Point number six, real leaders carry a burden for the people, which I just explained to you. And that's really what we see with Mordecai. You carry a burden for the people. Verse four, when King, Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. In other words, he desired not to be comforted. He has a relative that he's basically raised as a daughter in a high position. So he could have been taken care of. He could have escaped some of the trouble. But he's like, no, I don't want that for me because he was a good leader. He cared about everybody else. And so that leads us to this very important point. Courageous leaders know comfort can be an enemy to progress. So in any major history event that you see where there was a courageous leader, they always chose courage over comfort. Some of the greatest leaders of all time spent time in jail cells because they were fighting for other people. Innocent men, starting with Jesus, who was thrown in prison and ultimately crucified. Mandela, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, many, many great people chose courage over comfort in order to fight the system, to go against things that were wrong. And they weren't just fighting for them. They were th thinking about other people. Um, Mandela specifically, he could have found, got out and not have to spend, he spent 27 years in prison for doing absolutely nothing. And when he comes out of prison, he ends up being promoted as president. And instead of taking revenge, he tries to uplift all of South Africa. Great leaders are courageous and they choose courage over comfort. It had been much more comfortable for him to take revenge on everyone, but he understood it would have caused the detriment of his country. So he chose forgiveness. Forgiveness is not easy but he chose courage over comfort. Sometimes being too comfortable is the enemy of great progress. Verse five, then Esther sent for Hatach, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. She, she didn't even know what was going on. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the world treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He got the details and told the details. Mordecai gave head top a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. He asked Hatach to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Hatach to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. This shows us that Mordecai was, he didn't research the situation. He didn't got all the detail. He had such a burden that he cared. Some people was like, well, I don't really, I don't really vote because I don't know what's going on. Well, find out. Get the information. There's too much information for you to be lazy and not find out what's going on. Well, these people over here, they're being hurt. And I don't know why. It don't really affect me. I'm in Muncie. That's in Texas. Well, Study, figure it out. Mordecai knew everything that was going on. And so that leads me to this point, point number eight. Strong leaders come with both receipts and with the plan. He had all the details. He had copies of the stuff. I don't know how he got the copies, but he used his power to get the copies, to get stuff in, in writing. Sometimes you need a uh, in order to prove things, people go and find the law. They got to write the law down. If it's a law, it's got to be written down somewhere and get it out, get a copy of it, pass it around and tell people, hey, this is going on. And this happens in the reverse on the positive side. People don't do this too. Sometimes grant money is out there. Sometimes there's good things going on. College uh, benefits, uh, college grants and loans. And people don't tell folk. They, they'll just take it and go on. A good leader gets copies and he shares it with other people. Hey, 
even if it's as small as, as Wendy's got buy one, get one free hamburgers. I'm telling somebody I'm I'm sharing it, both the good and the bad. That's what good people do and good leaders do. So he got all the receipts, but he also had a plan. And his plan was, hey, go and beg for mercy. Listen, we are in dire straits and maybe you can do something about it. 10 and 12. Then Esther told Hatach to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. OK, I hear what you're saying, but all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die. One of their rules is even the queen, you can't just go and be in the king's inner court. Now, what I don't know, that could be meant when they're doing business, when it's not a, a quote unquote sexy time, you know, uh, that she could have been with him then. But when he is ruling, there's a rule. You can't go unless you're summoned for. So uh, I hear what you're saying, Mordecai, but I could die if I go and try to go unannounced and show up. It could be detrimental to me. Unless the king holds out his gold scepter and the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. So this is what Esther knows. Right now, for the next 30 days, I'm not really supposed to be interacting. And so uh, I can't go, especially if he doesn't hold the golden scepter. And so in other words, I'd be putting my life in danger to do what you're asking, Mordecai. Now, here's the thing. Mordecai knows this. He knows what he's asking of Esther. And Esther is responding the way she's responding. And so... So Hattach gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Point number nine, this is something we have to think of. Some leaders can only see the obstacles and not the possibilities. So yes, Mordecai had a plan for his mentee. Remember, Esther was, uh, he was Esther's mentor. She was the mentee. She was standing where she was because of him. So he's telling her what we need done, but she can only see the obstacles, not the possibilities. I want to put that up there again. So one of the reasons why I preach faith the way I do is because we are always challenged and we always have obstacles. But if I train you as a visionary, through what is possible and through faith, you won't just see obstacles, you will see possibilities. And so sometimes weak people, weak leaders, they only see what can't be done. I can't do it because of. Well, I can't try to go to school because I'm 55. Well, I can't get a house because I've rented for so long and my credit is bad. Well, I can't, I can't, I can't. But we need to start thinking about what I can, I can, I can. Here's the truth. The truth of the matter is there's a lot of things you can't do. What Esther was telling was the absolute truth. She was not summoned for 30 days. She could have been killed if she shows up unannounced. But what she's missing is with God, all things are possible. The reason why you have God in your life is to trump the obstacle and show you the possibilities. So, Verse 13, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Mordecai was not just going to take that as an answer. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. Basically, he's saying to her, don't forget who you are and don't forget where you came from. At the end of the day, you are a Jew like all of us. And so when they kill all of us, guess what? You can be in trouble too. Verse 14, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. I love what he's saying to her. He's saying, I want you to understand one monkey don't stop the show. So God has you in a place where you can make a difference. But if you choose not to, don't think you're the only avenue he can work through. I'm coming to you because I believe God wants to use you to make a difference. But if you choose not to, 
Don't think God is handicapped because you say no. He'll raise somebody else to do what you're supposed to do. So you need to look at this as an opportunity to partner with the will of God instead of thinking about all the obstacles that are in the way. Because if you don't do it, God will get somebody else to do it. But you'll actually perish. You'll actually die. You'll actually lose out. And he is not lying. There are people who lost out because they wouldn't stand up and do what God wanted done. And God raised somebody else to do it. And they end up going off the scene. At the beginning of this uh, study, I told you about how Saul rebelled. And it's the only reason why we have Haman uh, today. But Saul's rebellion and uh, disobedience caused him to go off the scene. He ended up dying and his household died all the way up to a person named Mephibosheth, and God raised up a David. And for the rest of the scripture, we hear so much more about David than we hear about Saul because Saul messed up. So Mordecai's telling Esther, hey, you can mess this all up by not stepping up to the plate and walking in courage. Then he makes this statement that is so beautiful. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, he's saying to her, it's a possibility that God orchestrated all of this, not just to get you to be the queen and not just to have the favor of God to promote you, but because he knew what was coming and you're putting this place strategically. So maybe you were promoted previously for this time. So that leads us to this powerful point. Wise mentors know timing is everything. So you were brought to this place for such a time as this. Timing is everything. 15 and 16. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a feast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. In other words, she heard what Mordecai was saying and she just be begin to go into action. And, and I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She took the words of Mordecai and she did a total 180 and said, okay, you know what? I'm about to take courage. If I die, I die. I'm getting ready to go see the king. I'm getting ready to make a difference. But what I need y'all doing, I need y'all praying for me. Y'all may not be in the position I am in, but I'm going to need your help. We're going to fast and we're going to fast together. We're about to work together. In other words, she heard what her mentor was saying and she began to understand this is my time to make a difference and I might die in the process. But listen, if I sit around and wait, I'm going to die anyway. So I might as well take matters in my own hand and I might as well go forward. 11. Esther realized timing is everything and prayer can change anything. So, hey, maybe this is my time, but if I get everybody praying and we all get together on one accord, anything can be changed. I might die in the process, but I'm getting ready to go. I'm getting ready to go see the king. The, the title of the sermon was I Saw the King. And if you read the rest of the story, she, she saw the king and she did not die. A difference was made. But then that just reminded me of this as I was coming to a close on Sunday and coming to a close today. So this is Palm Sunday. All this time I've had these palm branches in the background. And so how in the world can I connect the story of Esther with the real Holy Week that we were starting on Sunday with Palm Sunday? And so I decided to look at what we call the triumphal entry, triumphant entry. John 12, 12 through 16 says this. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it, it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. So this was written in the Old Testament. It is being copied again in the New Testament because they realized it was the fulfillment of that prophecy. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, meaning when he died and then he resurrected, then they remember that these things had been written about him and had been done 
to him. And so they begin to put two and two together. They begin to see the Old Testament scripture and realize they actually lived it in seeing the fulfillment of it. It didn't make sense at the time, but they realized that, oh my goodness, the king came. Here's the thing, the king came to die. They thought he came to overthrow Rome, so they didn't understand it until later. But that helped me make this tie-in, which I thought was so beautiful. Here is point number 12. Through faith, Esther faced death to go see the king. But through love, our king faced death to come see about us. So Esther had to get courage to go see the king. But because of the love of God, God sent the king to come see us. We don't have to be like Esther and muster up courage to say, hey, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to see the king because the king said, hey, if I die, it's okay. I'm going to come for my people. I cry Hosanna too because I saw the king. I didn't have to go see him like Esther because he came to see about me. The gospel message is the king took his kingly throne and gave it up to come in earth as a human and then to die for us so that we can accept the king. And so what Esther did was amazing. What Mordecai got Esther to do was amazing, to go beyond the demonic pressure. But what Jesus did is greater. He faced demons so that the king could come to us. And one of the things that we have to remember being Christians in this day and age, the Old Testament people, they went through hell just to get the glimpse of the king, both natural kings and the real king of kings. All we have to do is believe and say yes. So we should be the happiest creatures in the face of human history because the king came to us. And not only that, he lives on the inside of us. So that's something to thank God for and something to cry Hosanna about. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, appreciate you and honor you. You were the greatest king and you came to see us. We thank God for Esther and her courage to go and see the king and Mordecai encouraging her and telling her that this was her time. But this really is our time because the king came to us and the king lives in us and the king dwells with us. And because of that, we are king's kids, and there's nothing that is impossible to us. And for that, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great, wonderful week. We want to see you Sunday for Resurrection Sunday, and we're grateful for all that God has done. So thanks for tuning in. We're signing off. See you soon, both online and in the building to celebrate our resurrection of our King.